Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, I think a very, very difficult act to follow uh, because there, I think, nothing braver uh, than the women of Iran and Afghanistan. And uh, to hear this wonderful, wonderfully brave woman speaking from Kabul uh, makes me very emotional um, and makes me feel like uh, it, it's quite difficult to speak. Anyway, uh, I would like to take my few minutes that I have to talk about uh, education and liberation. So I've kind of changed what I'm going to say based on your introduction. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I want to talk about what's happening in Iran. And of course, the recent protest in Iran starts with this wonderful 22-year-old woman, Mahsa Jina Amini. She was visiting uh, Tehran from Iranian Kurdistan. She was stopped by security police, by morality police, for improper veiling. She was veiled, but she was improperly veiled, according to them. She was dragged off for re-education, and a few days later, she arrived at Castro Hospital, brain dead, dying on the 16th of September, killed for a few strands of hair. And of course, for the Islamic regime of Iran and its morality police, it was business as usual. They arrest millions of women and girls every year for improper veiling, arrest them, the punishment is fine, up to two years imprisonment, harassment, beatings, and so on. But what happened to Mahsa Amini was the straw that broke the camel's back. And we saw that the minute news came out of her being in a coma, brain dead with a fractured skull at Castro Hospital, protests started uh, being organized right in front of the hospital. The two women journalists that broke her story are still in prison since then, and they are charged with very heavy sentences of being against national security and so on and so forth. And we saw those protests continue in Iranian Kurdistan at her gravesite. Her parents wrote on her gravestone that dear Gina, Gina is Mahsa Amini's Kurdish name, because in Iran, Kurdish names are banned on official documents. Her real name is Gina. Dear Gina, you will not die. Your name will be a symbol. And that is exactly what has happened since the 16th of September. Since her death, there have been ongoing protests in Iran, what we are calling a women's revolution. It is led by women and girls, a Generation Z, that has uh, been truly inspiring the world. They are out there burning their hijabs, removing their hijabs, dancing in the streets, all things that are illegal in the Islamic regime of Iran. This is the first generation that has, from a young age, have portable digital technology in their very hands, they have footprints, they have access to the world, and they are brave beyond imagination. And in, in addition to the burning and um, removing of hijabs, we see uh, graffiti on the walls in Tehran, which says the body riots. And we see photos of young girls in Iran posting uh, photos of themselves by uh, slogans that say woman, life, freedom, taking control of their bodies, which has been a tool of the Islamic regime of Iran, not just to suppress women, but the society at large. Another phenomenon we're seeing is the turban flying phenomenon, which is young people running up behind clergy. And this is, it's called the turban flying phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's happening in many, many places. There is countless video footage of this taking place. And of course, we see that level of anti-clericalism that is similar to what we saw during the French Revolution against the church. We see that now here today in Iran. It is a center of anti-clericalism against Islam in power. This is the photo of a nine-year-old boy, Kian Pirfalak, who was killed by government forces. At his funeral, uh, this is what his mother says. <laughs> and 
And we see uh, very often that uh, places, uh, you know, grave sites and uh, burials, not being places of mourning and religious uh, ceremonies, but one of protest and resistance against the Islamic regime of Iran. This is a song that was also that has become very famous in Iran too. These are songs that are uh, there are lots of new revolutionary songs since the September 16th, and this is one of them. <laughs> And of course, we know you, you must have seen video footage of young women, schoolgirls, taking action and opposing both the Islamic State, its misogyny, as well as the hijab, which is not a piece of clothing, but uh, a tool that's been used to control women and girls from a very young age. And it's compulsory in Iran. And this is some images at, at schools. They're shouting shame on you, and it's uh, an official of the Islamic regime. They're shouting freedom, Azadi. down with the dictator. The Islamic regime of Iran, one of the first things it did when it came to power on the back of a people's revolution that was not an Islamic revolution, <coughs> when it came to power, it targeted women first. And one of their main slogans was, you either wear the veil or you will be punched. And they imposed the veil via acid attacks, actually pinning the veil on women's heads. And so it is something inspiring to see school children say, neither veil nor a punch, we want freedom and equality. And of course, the regime has faced these protests with unbelievable brutality, using weapons of war, rape as a weapon of suppressing the protests. They have killed over 500 protesters, 70 of them children. They have already executed four young working class men. A lot of men have come out into the streets in support of women's rights because what it clearly shows with the slogan, woman, life, freedom, is that the measure of freedom in a society is based on how much freedom women have. And I wanna show you a short clip about what types of repression the regime is using. There has been a real escalation where female protesters are, as you can see here, being openly assaulted, often sexually. But the violence against women, like the protests, are not confined to the Kurdish area. They are often focused on locations where the protests are most intense, like here in the capital, Tehran. <laughs> One of these stories is Armita Abbas, a typical 20 year old on social media, sharing her love of animals. And <laughs> in social media posts appearing under her name, 
Abbasi, like many young women in Iran, criticized the regime openly after the protests began. Unlike most, she did it without anonymity. It didn't take long for security forces to find and arrest her. Abbasi disappeared. Soon after, whistleblowers began to post on various social media platforms. Medics sharing eyewitness accounts of what had been done to Abbasi. First of all, they say, there were a few plainclothes men with her and they did not let her out of their sight. Even during a private medical examination, they were there. She was my patient. I went to her bedside. They had shaved her hair. She was scared and was trembling. When she first came in, they said it was rectal bleeding due to repeated rape. The plainclothes men insisted that the doctor write that the rape was from prior to her arrest and then after this issue was becoming obvious to all, they changed the entire scenario altogether. The details of these leaks were confirmed to CNN by an insider at Imam Ali Hospital, where Abbasi was brought to be examined. In a statement, the government said Abbasi was treated for digestive problems. The medics who treated her said that was not true. The Iranian regime denies the rape, accusing her of leading protests an allegation which could see her face to death. And of course, this is a situation for so many women and men who've been arrested. Now it's up to 20,000 people. So really, it's so key for feminists here in Britain and across the world to stand with these brave women, to defend them, not to let them be forgotten, and to defend this women's revolution as your very own. The thing that we're now, we're, we're, the, the fact that we're talking about education today, we see very clearly that this women's revolution is an education in liberation for the women and girls who live in Iran, for the men and boys in that society, but also for those in the region, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, across the Middle East and North Africa, languishing under, struggling under, mm -hmm. Islamic fundamentalism, but also women and girls struggling against other types of fundamentalisms like Hindu fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, and Buddhist fundamentalism. And I think it has a, a huge lessons for feminists here in this country because for too long we have heard uh, how, how often have those of us who've been defending women's rights um, here as well as in Iran and the Middle East? How often have we heard that the veil is a tool for liberation? How often have we seen women wear the hijab in solidarity with women who are oppressed in the region? It's as if you would carry out FGM, in my opinion, to support women and girls who've been mutilated. How often have we heard that we should be silent because of accusations of Islamophobia, and accusations of bigotry. And I think one of the things we've said right from the beginning, and hopefully it's becoming more clear now as a result of the women's revolution in Iran, is that it is not bigotry to criticize ideas. It is not bigotry to stand up for women's rights against religious and patriarchal rules that deny women their humanity and their bodily autonomy. How long, how long has cultural relativism been defended? And also how long has there been restrictions on our free expression? Uh, very often we've been left on our own, minority women on our own, to fight these issues because we've been told not to cause offense. Uh, whereas the real offense, the real provocation comes from the Islamists and their denial of women's rights. I think. Uh, the main question here comes from the la a labor refrain, which side are you on? Which side are you on? And I think the only response to this question has to be on the side of Xinjiang.